In the Moroccan city of Meknes, along Boulevard al Habul, which curves along the edge of the old Medina, a nondescript entryway gives out onto a long, inclined, weather-beaten, whitewashed passageway open to the sky. The passage leads up to a double door opening onto a stark, cavernous room covered in hasira mats and striped carpets. There was nothing ever physically or architecturally remarkable about the plain rendered brick structure or the utilitarian interior decor, yet in 1971, crossing the threshold of this empty space was to walk into a parallel universe an intensely radiant world concealed by the daily rigors of worship, learning, and service, and revealed in circles of remembrance carried out within its walls. The light that saturated this unprepossessing edifice emanated from a single centenarian saint and his illuminated followers. This was the Zawiya of the teaching sheikh, Sidi Muhammad, Ibn al-Habib. In 1971, this venerable scholar saint presided over his zawiyah as he had since 1936 when it was first established as a place for learning and the practices leading to the purification of the heart and the knowledge of God. He was 65 years old when he opened his zawiyah, the age when most men retire. He had now reached his centenary, and this would be his final year on earth. The Habibi Zawiya served as the home of the sheikh and a center for instruction and discipline of aspirants on the spiritual path of Islam, following the tradition of Imam Abu Hassan al-Shazali in accordance with the teachings of his spiritual descendant, Muli al-Arabi al-Darqawi, and his successors. Sheikh Muhammad ibn al-Habib brought the full force of 19th century Sufism in all its rigor and purity into the 20th century, and then, over a period of 60 years, guided generations of sincere seekers to the knowledge of God. This is the opening to the illustrated biography of Sidi Muhammad ibn al-Habib, one of the nine volumes comprising the Exemplars for Our Time series. When Peter Sanders and I took on this project in 2020, there was no question but that we would profile this great Moroccan sage. Fifty years ago, we had both crossed the threshold just mentioned and walked into this luminous world, which became the measure of authenticity for us on the spiritual path and the inspiration for the work we've both been doing ever since. At the beginning of the project, we commissioned a distinguished scholar specializing in the history and metaphysics of the Darqawi tradition to write the biography and were confident that it would be outstanding. In the event, and at the last moment, our scholar had to withdraw from the project for personal reasons. It was too late to find and commission another biographer, but both of us felt that it was essential to retain Sheikh Mohammed ibn al-Habib in the series. So at the eleventh hour, and feeling completely inadequate to the task, I set about researching and writing his biography. I was blessed to be able to draw upon three resources, short biographies by Muli Abdul Kabir, Ibn Hashim al Belghiti, the son of Ibn al Habib's eventual successor, Sidi Abdul Salam Ibn Abdul Qadir Ibn Sauda, and Dr. Al-Akhtar Kuwaidari of the Habibi Zawiya in Laghwat, Algeria. I received additional help from my scholarly brothers, Sidi Shakir Masood, Sidi Michael Abdurrahman Fitzgerald, Sidi Muhammad Fuad Aris Mouk, and Dr. Karim Laham. What became quickly and painfully clear was that every recorded account was incomplete, fragmentary, speculative, and understandably full of inaccuracies and gaps given the paucity of source material. About thirty years ago, Peter and I discussed the idea of doing a book on contemporary sages, on Ibn al-Habib in particular, 
with the idea that we would track down surviving disciples and companions, record their stories, collect old photographs and capture new images, and piece together a picture of who these people really were and what it was really like to sit in their presence and learn from them. But we had young families to support, and at the time this grand project, which would have taken both of us away for weeks or months at a time, was untenable. That was really the last chance to record eyewitness accounts of Ibn al-Habib and his companions, because so many were still living. In the end, we each found our own way to memorialize the saints and sages we've met. In 2013, I published Signs on the Horizons, and in 2019, Peter published his monumental photo essay, Meetings with Mountains. In a very real sense, Exemplars for Our Time has been a continuation of this work, and the teachings of Sidi Muhammad ibn al-Habib have informed every aspect of its implementation. Those Western converts who met ibn al-Habib encountered a great saint at the end of his journey in this world, who had earned the reverence and love of tens of thousands of his students and companions throughout Morocco and Algeria, what they witnessed was a living legacy, a transcendent presence, a man of God in completion, and the luminous results of his teaching in the many saintly men and women he guided. What they could not see was the trajectory of his life from birth to youth to maturity to seniority to old age. This is the biographer's imperative. But in order to tell this story, it was necessary to present a visceral picture of what it actually was like to be sitting in a room full of saints. To do this, I reached out to my companions to write down their impressions of their time during the last year of the sheikh's long life. In that year, and in the two or three years that followed, the parallel universe remained a palpable reality. Every year the Fukhara would gather in Meknes around their sheikh to celebrate the birth of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Mawlid and Nabi. Disciples would come from throughout Morocco and Algeria, from desert settlements, mountain villages, and modern cities. They came from every walk of life. Some were elegant and affluent, some were indigent and raggedy, and some were wild and woolly. Businessmen, bankers, beggars, scholars, school teachers, craftsmen, shepherds, farmers, shopkeepers, and taxi drivers all assembled to remember God and to celebrate the life of the Prophet wasalam, in the presence of their master. In 1971, the Maulid season took place in the month of May. Men of God and spiritual aspirants from all over Morocco and Algeria gathered to remember the life of the Prophet Muhammad, the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and called down blessings upon him and his family and companions. In these sacred circles, rapturous poetry was sung in praise of the Prophet, the Dalai al-Khairat of Imam al-Jazuli, the Burda of Imam al-Busseri, and a treasury of odes, qasaid, from saints and sages of Islam. The generality of Muslims in North Africa celebrated the Mawlid according to social and religious convention. For the Sufi orders, the Mawlid was a transcendent spiritual event. That year, a handful of Westerners joined the gathering. Most were new to Islam, all were novices. Few had ever laid eyes on a saint or, for that matter, had any idea what a saint was. Suddenly they were sitting in the presence of one of the greatest living saints of the age and surrounded by other men who had attained stations of sainthood under his guidance. Imam al-Shazari was once asked why he did not write books. He replied, My companions are my books. The sheer number of illuminated souls gathered that spring who claimed Sheikh ibn al-Habib as their guide and their collective incandescence was testament to the majesty of this spiritual master. The power of the light from these men, its penetrating clarity, and the discipline and self-denial that produced it by the grace and mercy of God 
could be almost unbearable for the self-absorbed novice accustomed to the endless distractions and self-gratifications of the modern world. Here was a pre-modern world where the ego was the enemy and God was the friend. And according to the wisdom of the path, the only way the enemy could be defeated was to be occupied by remembrance and love of the friend. With relentless, single-minded intensity, the sincere disciples of Ibn al-Habib turned away from the ego and by remembering God at all times, aspired to lose themselves in their love of God. My servant never ceases drawing near to me by supererogatory works until I love him. And when I love him, I become the hearing by which he hears, the sight by which he sees, the hand by which he strikes, and the foot by which he walks. Were he to ask of me, I would surely give to him, and were he to seek refuge with me, I would surely give him refuge. Hadith Qudsi The Prophet Muhammad wasalam, asked God, Let me live among the poor, die among the poor, and be raised up among the poor. One of the high points of the Maulid season was a night of remembrance in a ramshackle shanty town on the outskirts of Meknes called the Borj. There was a particular power to this evening organized and overseen by the sheikh's representative, his muqaddim, a rugged fakir whose tongue was ceaselessly busy with the remembrance of God, even in his sleep. The late poet Daniel Abdelhai Moore wrote in his memoir, The first night of our arrival, a dark and starless, rainy night, we all went off to the Borge, a very poor district just outside Meknes, for a night of dhikr, to the zawiyah of one of the sheikh's muqaddams. We trekked through the muddy road to a smallish shack whose minaret was a bunch of old boards nailed together you couldn't climb into to call the adhan. We walked over a board with a sluice underneath it to get into the zawiyah. But inside, what a palace! Many of the older fukara who had been with the sheikh all their lives sat against one wall, wall-to-wall fukara reciting Qur'an in unison, then songs from the sheikh's diwan, then a hadra. Then it ended, and we sat where we had been standing, a recitation from Qur'an and a short discourse. Then, somehow in that crush, little wooden tables were brought in and plates of couscous and meat. With mountain men, city dwellers, and now us, this raw group of Westerners seated among each other in perfect connection. Every Thursday night, Laylatul Juma, the Sheikh or a Muqaddim would preside over a Laylatul Fukara, a night of the poor. The night would begin with the sunset prayer and the recitation of the litany or wird. Fukara would then sing odes from the Sheikh's Diwan led by singers steeped in the ancient Andalus musical tradition. The Diwan of Ibn al-Habib is rare among Diwans in that it is a collection of both ecstatic expressions of love for God and his messenger and clear, concise instructions on taking the spiritual path and the rewards of doing so. When the hearts were gathered and beating as one, the singers would change the melody and cadence to a pulsating rhythm, accelerating to a crescendo with the recitation of the tahlil, La ilaha illallah. Then the gathering would stand, forming a circle, or a series of concentric circles, each fakir holding the hand of the fakir on either side. With a collective inward gravity and intense concentration, the assembly began the hadra with one voice, a slow, unison, Hey, la, hey, la, hey, la, hey, la. The fukara swaying together back and forth with each articulated breath, 
gradually quickening the pace. The Hadra, also known as the Imara, had been a central practice of all the Shazaliya Darkawiya orders for centuries, and the Sheikh emphasized its importance as a practice which can shorten the way to a spiritual opening for the aspirant, if performed according to its conditions. He said the imara of a quarter of an hour is equivalent to a spiritual retreat of one week. A half-century later, one of the Western novices remembered the aged sheikh in the middle of the circle with all his fukara, including myself, encircled around him like the sun, and with us like planets revolving around him, virtually still, controlling us effortlessly without having to direct us with anything other than his breath. Outside the circle, soaring voices, piercing and mellifluous, sang ecstatic poems from the diwan of the sheikh and other saints, lifting hearts to hidden spiritual heights, the invocation changed to hi, 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 hi. The swaying ceased and became an incessant, exhilarating bounce until there was nothing other than susurrant, racing breath. Hi, 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 hi. The sheikh would call out, Muhammadun Rasulullah, to signal an end to the hadra and for the assembly to be seated. The Qur'an reciter with a crystalline voice would seal the hadra with verses chosen by the sheikh, after which he would deliver a commentary to hearts softened, focused, and made receptive by the invocation. His words were loaded with a century of learning and experience of the divine realities. The discourse following the hadra was an essential part of the Laylatul Fuqara. For the novice, the atmosphere in these gatherings was shimmering with an almost blinding light. The entire assembly was overwhelmed as the sheikh delivered his lesson in a quiet, sober, authoritative voice, as if he was laying down simple facts, which in fact he was. But these were facts about the consequences of this life and the absolute realities of the afterlife, its ecstasies, and its horrors, imparted with the authority of an eyewitness. Throughout the assembly one could see grown men trembling, hands covering their faces, weeping at the sheikh's words. There were shrieks of ecstasy and fear from among these men of God. Some fainted dead away. Hearts were unlocked and opened. Thresholds were crossed. May God be well pleased with Sheikh Muhammad ibn al-Habib and his illuminated library of companions and allow us to hold on to and benefit from his teachings.